You know, I really got to be careful what I wish for because, you know, when I travel to these places, I want to see the worst weather they have to offer. Ah, but the Canadian Arctic, that could be life or death. Ah. The Canadian Arctic is the destination for my next adventure. It's so cold. The fierce climate of Baffin Island is waiting to chew me up and spit me out. So I'm getting some polar training from a world-class expert. I've been blasted, scalded, oh. fried, and drenched. Now it's time to get frozen. Oh, what fresh hell is this? Exploration isn't just a physical challenge. Although it takes tremendous athletic ability to pull a 100 kilogram sled through the blistering cold day after day, it takes more. It also takes mental toughness, the will to keep going. It's about attitude, and no one has more attitude than Maddie McNair. Maddie has trained polar explorers for more than 20 years. She's led expeditions to both poles, the high Arctic, and Greenland. The queen of the ice. She's known as the alpha bitch of the north. And I'm her next student. Well, the first step in the preparations for my trek to the Canadian Arctic has got to be getting equipped. And boots are one of the most important things. I'm on my way to meet Paul Hubner. This man owns a boot company that builds boots that are rated down to minus 100 degrees. Yes, minus 100 degrees. After years of exploration in some of the harshest conditions you can imagine, there's one thing I've learned. Success starts at the bottom. Take care of your feet, and your feet will get you where you want to go. And proper footwear is the key. Paul Hubner's company makes footwear designed to withstand the extreme cold we'll be experiencing on our trip. But Paul doesn't just build boots, he tests them himself in the far reaches of the planet. He's been to both the North and the South Pole. Continue right up the valley. And I think he's the ideal person to travel with on my trek through the Arctic. At the airport, I meet up with Paul and his son, Ryan, who will be making the trek with us. After our flight to Iqaluit, it's time to meet the boss and get on our way. Maddie? Hey, all right. Hi, I'm George. Hi, George. Good to meet you. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Paul. Paul, How good you to doing? meet you. Welcome to the Arctic. Maddie first came to the Arctic in 1990 and fell in love with it. Soon, she began training and leading teams of explorers to Baffin Island, Greenland, and ultimately, the North Pole. After a short ride to her house in Iqaluit, Maddie wastes no time getting us prepared for the grueling trip ahead. Okay, let's go. Welcome to winter in Iqaluit. I'm saying it's probably minus 20 or more. We got very strong winds today and blowing snow, so it's not the best day to go camping, but hey, I go after the extremes, right? And the most important and complicated part of Arctic exploration is clothing. It's essential to regulate body heat while working and resting, because up here, you sweat, you die. All right, so I've just gone through the whole clothing system with Maddie, and the idea is 
wicking layer, top and bottom, my windproof breathable pants for the bottom, an anorak on top, and then my waterproof layer on top of that, goggles with a nose piece, balaclava, and a double set of gloves. And then, the big ass baffin boots. This is what's gonna keep my feet warm. And if your feet are cold, then you're gonna be miserable. Keeping up with Maddie is going to be the hard part, I think. I hope I got everything. OK, time to go. Well, I had to show these young jokers what it's like to pull a sled through the ice. As Maddie gleefully charges off into the blistering wind, I can't help but think, what have I gotten myself into this time? I'm in the Canadian Arctic, getting survival training from one of the world's leading experts, Maddie McNair. So we have three very, very simple hand signals. This one means stop. This one means come. And this one means are you okie dokie? Stop, come, okie dokie. Yes. Oh, look at the move on this guy. You gotta use your hips. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> One sec, I got some money. I like to stuff it in your jeans. <laughs> hey, a guy's got to make a buck somehow. <laughs> Once we get out onto the sea ice, it's immediately clear what a challenge this is going to be. Navigating this terrain takes skill and determination. Whew. Not so easy. Maddie works like a machine out here, but a lifetime of experience has taught her exactly how hard to push and not overheat, which out here could spell death. It's tricky keeping the right balance of cold versus hot, because when you're exercising, you really are generating a lot of heat, but you don't want to sweat. So you don't want to push too hard that you sweat, but you want to push hard enough that you stay warm. But as soon as you stop, on goes the heavy coat. nightfall approaching fast, we get a chance to try making camp in heavy Arctic winds. Good. All right. That was... <laughs> With a few tricks from Maddie, we're safe and secure. But this is just the beginning. Now, tonight's exercise is just the practice run, getting the tent set up, pulling the pulks, the real test is going to be when we get up to Pangnerton, up into Ayawitook National Park. That's the remote area. I think dinner's ready. I can't even begin to tell you how cold it is this morning. I think my camera is malfunctioning, so I don't even know if this is recording or not. The uh, clear skies last night, temperatures at least minus 20 with extremely strong winds. Oh, my hand is freezing right now just holding this camera. I can't do this for long. Ah! Oh. oh, it sucks. How are you guys doing? Uh, a little chilly, but yeah, not too bad. Got, got bundled up and uh, the wind really started kicking in over the night, so that was the one that kind of woke me up with it. You know, the tent flapping. Yeah, I know. And, uh, the temperature dropped about 10 degrees, so. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Hawaii, but it'll do. In these conditions, the only way to get warm is to get moving. But even if the work keeps your core temperature up, the extremities take a beating. That's a slog. It doesn't look like a whole lot, but that is one steep hill. Now imagine doing this for 60 days straight. How does Maddie handle the seemingly endless grind of these polar expeditions? I don't find it that hard. Maybe that's it. 
I've learned that I can do it in a way that when I'm skiing or pulling pokes through rough stuff, I, I take it on as a challenge and I learn how to bring it through using some technique or skiing with technique. Um, so for me, it doesn't become so difficult. It would be pretty demoralizing if I was always exhausted or cold. Six, seven hours pulling 150 pounds in the cold, that's very challenging. But that's what they're gonna need to do if you wanna go to the South Pole or the North Pole. So, on with the training. Pushing and dragging our sleds over this inhospitable terrain. With the occasional stop for minor accidents. My knee hit a block of ice on the way down. It's okay, it's not too bad, but. At least my kneecap's in one piece. The terrain here might be a bit treacherous, but this is a realistic simulation of the polar conditions further north. Yeah, the terrain we've just been going through is um, kind of like the pressure ridges that you'd find at the North Pole. But this is basically what it's like because the ice comes together and it breaks up in chunks like you can see. So it's great practice. So Maddie's picked a perfect spot for us to get familiar with hauling our pulks up and making sure that we can negotiate all the rubble. Up and over. And for all our hard work so far, we've traveled... About one nautical mile. That's all? <laughs> but no matter what our progress, being out on this floating ice is an exhilarating experience. Run, 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 run! The ice here, it's amazing. It's like it's a living creature. Twice a day, the tide goes up and down here in Frobisher Bay, and it's some of the highest tides in the world, 30 to 40 feet in some places. And the ice heaves and buckles and shifts, and you can hear it cracking, and all these crevices open up. It's totally like it's alive. And filled with many interesting diversions. These pressure ridges create some fascinating, although sometimes very tight passageways to explore. A little unnerving when you know they could disappear at any time. The scary thing is, is that this is shifting, jumbling sea ice, and it's shifting up and down with the tides. So this cave might not be here in an hour. I'm trying to enjoy the solitude of the sea ice, because from here on in, this journey is going to the dogs. <laughs> I've relocated to Pangerton, 300 kilometers north of Iqaluit, preparing to get schooled by polar explorer Maddie McNair, with help from her son Eric, you just want to run, don't you? And two teams of tough Eskimo sled dogs as part of my Arctic training. We've got two dog teams set up here. Well, they're not quite set up yet. We still need to get them strung up and then head out for our first night up to Ayoituk. The problem is it's hard to lash these dogs up in minus 20 temperatures. Getting 16 hyperactive, ready-to-run dogs to sit still is nearly impossible. Part den mother, part high school principal, Maddie is clearly the alpha dog in this pack. Get down. Get down. Without her unquestioned authority, these sleds would go nowhere fast. I've skied behind a boat before, but I've never skied behind a team of dogs before. <laughs> Wish me luck. Maddie, what are the chances of me not breaking my leg today? Oh, maybe 2%. 2 percent. <laughs> hey! Up we go! These dogs can run eight hours a day at speeds up to 25 kilometers per hour. It's a far cry from the slow, deliberate pace over the sea ice back in the Callow. 
Well, I've tried dog sledding before, but never quite like this. It's a totally different style. You're not actually riding on the sled, skiing behind it. It's kind of like holding on to the bumper of a moving truck. When these dogs go, they just go. Not being used, taking the skins off the skis, kind of being used to pulling a pulp, and then all of a sudden having these dogs just go off at breakneck speeds like a firecracker. It was uh, on ice, it was amazing. It was just hang on for dear life. And at these speeds, on this terrain, there's no margin for error. my balance hit a bump and my binding came off and I grabbed onto this wooden piece here at the very very back on the bottom and went for a bit of a drag I felt like one of those cowboys you know in those cowboy movies where he's being dragged behind the horse through the dust and the dirt but here it's rock hard ice oh, yeah. and dog poop After a long, bitterly cold day of sledding, we stop and make camp as the dogs get wind of their delicious fish dinner. But they might not be the only ones. Tonight's objective is to sleep as far away from the fish heads as we can. I have a feeling the polar bear is going to be able to smell this from miles away. Did he say polar bears? Hello? Is this thing working? Our cameras aren't working. Nothing's working. It's minus 30. Everything's screwed up. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> if you're watching this, it's only because our camera has not spontaneously just frozen to a block of ice, which they've been doing left and right. There's good snow here. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Uh, just under Mount Thor. Polar explorer Maddie McNair is leading me and a team of dogs on an Arctic training expedition. There's one section of the trail she forgot to mention. A rocky, frozen riverbed filled with giant boulders, treacherous crevices. Easy! And plenty of ice. Ready? An absolute nightmare to navigate all these dogs and our huge sleds through. Dog sleds and granite do not mix. While the dogs are doing most of the work, it's still frustrating and exhausting for the humans on the team. Come on! Our progress is being measured in millimeters now. And we're slowed even further by the endless fouling of the ropes and harnesses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yes. The process goes something like this. Drag the sleds across the rocks. Untangle the lines. Drag the sleds across some more rocks. Untangle the lines. Drag the sleds across some more rocks. Untangle the dogs. Break up the fights between the dogs. Untangle the humans. Oh, and did I mention that all these ropes are full of dog crap? We finally muscle our way out of the boulder field and onward to another important destination I can now cross off my list. 
So what is the Arctic Circle? It's actually the spot that's the furthest south that receives 24 hours of daylight at least once per year and 24 hours of darkness at least once per year. Right here. We arrive at our last campsite of the trip. And after we take care of the dogs, we settle in, relax, and enjoy the spectacle of the Northern Lights. But the unpredictable weather of Baffin Island isn't finished with me yet. Early the next morning, we're blasted awake by a fierce storm which destroys our campsite. We seek refuge in a shelter built here for just such an emergency. Okay, Eric and I are gonna head back down to what's left of our camp and see if we can find all the missing items because we don't even know what blew away and what didn't. rushing in, bam, knocks the whole thing down. Winds must have been 80 kilometers an hour, maybe higher, hard to say. Time to sift through the rubble. Arctic exploration is not for everyone. The extreme remoteness and often fierce conditions on this part of the planet keep most from ever experiencing it. But for a few, like Maddie McNair, once they get here, they never want to leave. When I first came up to the Arctic, I was blown away by the sense of space, by the sense of silence, and the light. The light here is different. I feel like I'm on a different planet. I feel like I have a lot of freedom up here just to breathe. Every time I come home, I just think, I love living here. This is where I want to be. As for me, I'll go back to my home in the south. But this adventure with Maddie has planted the seed for future explorations. Perhaps I should take on the North Pole.